Clarity on Fire, a podcast for people who know what they don't want out of their life and career, but aren't sure what they'd rather be doing. In a world where it's easy to exist, but hard to feel alive, we, Kristen and Rachel, two certified life and career coaches, are here to help you cut through the information overload, get unstuck, and focus not just on how you can have a career you're passionate about, but how to create a whole life that feels fulfilling. So join us here, where we serve up inspiration and down-to-earth wisdom in a way that only two best friends can. We want you to experience the relief of knowing that, yes, you're allowed to want more out of your life and career. And no, you don't have to wander through the dark anymore. Our job is to light the fire that shows you the way. Let's go. Okay, so here we are. And before we get into this episode, I want to pause and remind you of something very important that we're doing right now. (laughs) But in the lead up to that, I actually want to quote a statistic that was really interesting that one of our listeners sent to me in a LinkedIn article the other day. I can even link to this in the show notes if you guys want me to, this article. There is a statistic, uh, it's a very sobering statistic that says 1% of full-time workers, so anybody, who are fulfilled in life are unfulfilled at work. What? I had not heard this before. Yeah. She just said it, obviously. That is insane. Yeah, right. So what what that means is that you have a 1% chance of being fulfilled in your life if you are not feeling fulfilled in your career. Wow. So, I mean, we know this from our clients that this is an incredibly important part of your life and it seeps into every other area of your life, but it's still sobering to hear that. Literally, you have basically no chance if you can't be happy in your career, whatever that means, that you're not going to be happy in the rest of your life. Or at least 99 out of 100 of you aren't going to be happy. (laughs) So here's an interesting (laughs) follow-up statistic that's in that article, though. If you have a peer to have coaching conversations with, you are nearly twice as likely to be fulfilled. And this is just peer coaching. Wow. Yeah, you have a 63% likelihood of fulfillment. Isn't that interesting? What a cool study. Yeah, so that's just with peers. So imagine how much more that statistic goes up when you're being coached by someone who actually knows what the hell they're doing. An actual trained coach? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. Who does this for a living? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. So I bring this up, obviously, because on Tuesday, you should go back and listen to that episode if you haven't. Kristen and I made two really big announcements. And one is that we are going to be changing the way that we take on -on one-on-one coaching clients. And we're going to be doing it only via enrollment now, which basically means we're going to be taking clients on in waves a few times per year. And we're only taking 20 people between, well, it's going on now. We're going to be accepting kind of sign up forms between now and next Friday, the 21st. Signing up does not mean that you are 100% committing to working. It just means that if you are seriously considering working with us, that you have until next Friday to fill out a form and then we will get on the phone with you at some point in the coming weeks and talk about it. And if you're not ready to get started, if this is not kind of like a, oh, this is kicking my procrastinating butt in the pants, then that's (laughs) fine. But we now have a wait list too. So if you don't want to get started anytime between like now and the next six weeks, which is kind of what we're looking at, then you can have your name added to our waitlist, which is link is in the episode description for all of this. And then we will contact you if and when there are openings, which there will be, but we just can't guarantee when. Right. And we also can't guarantee when we're going to be reopening no, we really don't a know. bunch more spots for coaching again. It's not going to be for several months, at least. We yes. can assure you of that. But if you're on the wait list, then you might get contacted by us before we open it up for another wave of people. But we just can't guarantee it like we do when we have these waves. So right now, we can guarantee around 20 spots for people who are interested in starting with coaching. And if you want to raise your hand and be one of those people, definitely fill out that form and at least talk to us about it. Yeah. The other thing that we announced on Tuesday is that we are going to be doing a brand new course later this summer, all about 
overcoming your people pleasing tendencies. Cause we know you guys are people pleasers because <laughs> that's our most listened to podcast ever. So you guys have given yourself away. Podcast we know- episode. I, I always nitpick you when you say this, but that's because we don't have a podcast about people pleasing. We no, have we don't have a episode about separate. people pleasing. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. We don't have a whole separate podcast about that. No, that's true. Uh, So we're building a course around this topic because we know that this is resonating with you guys. We don't have any information to share yet, though. But (laughs) if you want the information when it's ready to share, we do have a VIP list that you can go enter your name and email address onto. And we'll make sure you're the first to know when we've got updates. You'll obviously be the first to know when it's ready to open enrollment. And if you decide to join us for this newest round of coaching between now and the 21st, then you will get that course for free when it's available. Yeah. So one more incentive. So if you want all of the details about what we just said, because we cannot spend this whole episode, obviously talking about this, we did that on Tuesday. So go back to the episode before this, where it's just called two big announcements from us and you can get all of the details and decide which of these things, if any, are something you're intrigued in. And then you can sign up to talk to us about coaching, or you can add your name to the wait list, or you can get on the VIP list about the people-pleasing course whenever that is ready. You'll know. Okay, so that business addressed. Do you now want to read? Now on to the actual podcast yeah. so, that we're doing today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, well, this is good because if you want to know what it's like to work with, you know, to work with one of us, Sarah was my client. And this is interesting because she, I hadn't really caught up with her in like a couple of years, basically since we had finished coaching. And life goes on after a person finishes coaching, the hope is. (laughs) And this was a really good conversation about the ups and downs of what happens after you get what you think you want and then you lose what you got. And then you have to build back up to something else, finding a new dream job. And she's an incredibly fun and inspiring and just like very like I feel like she would be a good hugger I've never met her in person but I just <laughs> feel like she would be a really good hugger that's Sarah so do you want to read that's Sarah's her energy. okay yeah do you want to read Sarah's <laughs> bio please yes okay Sarah Griffin is a social media manager by day at night she's exploring a variety of curiosities and passions and writing about them in her blog and journal she has bachelor's degrees in English and theater and a master's in philanthropic studies. She lives in Indiana with her husband and 10-year-old Sharpe Juno. She is a lifetime learner who loves adventure, personal development, and conversations about this crazy journey called life. So that's Sarah in a nutshell. I think you guys are going to get a lot out of this. And this is just one of those that's... It's, it's like an instant classic in my mind because we talk about stuff that is so core to the human experience that everyone has, that there's no one who's going to listen to this and not be able to relate in some way or another. So I hope you will enjoy this and we will be back at the end in about an hour. (laughs) Hi, Sarah. Hi, Rachel. I'm so excited to be talking to you. I know that probably every time I talk to someone, I say, you are one of my favorite people ever to work with. (laughs) And maybe that's true because I tend to ask people (laughs) to be on the podcast when I feel like I had a really good experience or a really good relationship with them, or just I felt like their journey was just so important that other people needed to hear it. But it is true that you really are one of my favorite people, one of the standout people that I've ever worked with. Well, thank you. That means a lot to me. I It's been a journey and uh, continues to be so, but I feel like I learned so much from you. And I'm really, really excited that you asked me to be part of this. Well, I feel like I learned a lot from you, which sounds corny, but really <laughs> I did because you're just a really wise old soul. Like it's just It just radiates off of you. And I just love people like that, obviously. I'm just Aww. attracted to people like that. <laughs> Yeah. So, okay. So what people listening to this don't know is that I haven't actually spoken to you over the phone in over two years that we first started coaching together. I looked it up. It was November of 2015. So that was three and a half years ago, Wow, which was a long time ago. Yeah. And so basically you've sent me some email updates in the past two plus years or really three years since we probably were done coaching. And so 
I am just as curious to hear about what happened after we stopped working <laughs> together as those people are, because as much as I think people might be interested in what we do together when we're coaching, I think people are very curious about what happens afterward. Yeah. And so, I mean, I do also want to hear about like where you were at before you even, before we even met. But anyway, I want to hear about your journey and okay. where you have been in the past few years and what's been up for you. Yeah. Well, thank you. It has been, um, like I mentioned, quite a journey over the last few years. And I think when I reached out to you all, I was in a job and had that feeling. You and Kristen talk about it, that this isn't perfect, but there's nothing really wrong with it, but it's not my passion. But do I even have... I was having just an identity crisis of like, who am I and what's important to me? And if something is important to me, how do I follow it? So th- then we, I did the course and then I did coaching and we can talk about that more in depth um, and some of the things that I learned from that. But after that, coming through that, I learned a lot about myself. And on the other side, I really took some time to ask myself, like, what is it you want? Because that's what everyone asked me. What is it you want? And I couldn't come up with a good answer. I just knew it wasn't where I was. And so I changed first my attitude about where I was. And I took off this weight of this is going to be forever and just said, Mm -hmm. what is it that I need to learn here from these people, from this position, from where I am? And which just changed the whole like outlook I had for that position because I was getting to be kind of grumbly and things were lining up. But I found out it was because I was, I don't know, like just really focused on myself. And when I stopped focusing on myself and started focusing on what is the idea that I can take from this to move on, that's when things really started happening for me. Things kept lighting up. The universe kept saying, I got your back, keep going. So I started a new position. Um, I was offered a really cool pioneer job with a different company. They promised me all these great challenges and and it was a lot more money and I was going to have a lot more control, which is important to me. I'm a fire starter. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I wanted that control and that went great for a while. And then that job changed. That job, the company's priorities changed. It changed into a role that was not right for me and that I was not right from. So the company and I had to separate. Um, It was just, we both knew it. And I was terrified. And then you get back in that place where you're asking yourself questions about what do you want? And do I just take a job because it's a job? Or do I really try to follow my passion. And I got so lucky because I ended up in a place where I am now, where I get to be creative every day. I write, which is one of the things um, you and I talked a lot about. I get to write every day. I get to create content. I get to create strategy. I have both the support of a team and control of my own domain, which were the two like kind of sides of the coin that I was after. And so that's where I am now is in a job that allows me that space to be creative. And I, it took me years after coaching for me to realize like, this is what's important to me Mm. and this is what I want. And I had to, to do some trial and error to get here. (laughs) Yes. So I'm, I'm, we're going to talk about the trial and error. In, <laughs> yeah. in your email update to me, when you were telling me some of this, you said, just remember with your current clients that it can take years for some of this stuff to <laughs> sink in and that it just might take a while for <laughs> yes. them to get it. But I do get it now. <laughs> it's so true. There are things we would talk about and on like an intellectual level, like I got it. Okay. Right. Like how we talk about fear and we talk about... Um, Uh, the desire mapping. Yeah. But I had to do desire mapping so many times for me to really pinpoint the words and the feelings I was after. Yeah. Because even when you first do it, I think you're still thinking about what should I want? And taking away the should is really, was really hard for me. What did you think you should want? I thought that I, as a fire starter, that I should want to own my own business. That's what I thought. Well, I'm a fire starter, so I should want to work on my own. And then I was in a position where I didn't own my own business, but I had the freedom. 
as if I own my own business and I was miserable. And I'm like, well, how am I a fire starter? Yeah. <laughs> if I don't fit in this bucket. And so I, it took me years to stop putting myself in buckets, whether it was my Meyer Brig bucket or my passion profile bucket or my desire map bucket. Like I had to make those work for me instead of trying to put myself into those. What is your Meyer Briggs bucket again? I am an INFP. Okay. I was like, she's got to be an FP or an FJ and you are. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I actually, every other time I take it, I get J or P so and I've learned say, that. Yeah, you give off big INFJ energy to me, but I'm probably biased because I'm coming from that's my result. Too. Is that yours? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, every time I take it, I'm right on that line. And I think it's because I organize naturally, but I enjoy like the spontaneity of life. Okay. And so I think that's something I struggled with in a career is having both like structure both and, yeah. and support and freedom yep. and creativity and, you know, spontaneity and variety yeah. and all of that. Yeah. So that was something I really struggled with was balancing those. How do you, how do you have both of those? But now I do. So... Okay. Earlier, you were saying, so the arc, when you hear it back like that to an outside person sounds pretty clean and it doesn't sound messy at all, except I think it was really messy. And I want to talk about (laughs) how messy it was. So one of the things that I remember coaching you around very specifically was, and this is very normal. This is something I coach pretty much everybody around, but I very clearly remember talking to you about it, which was, you really, and you were mentioning this earlier, which is why it's been brought up again in my mind, that you really had this, I don't want to say preoccupation, but kind of your career needing to be forever, not yeah. for now. And yes. you said, once I got to the point where I actually believed things can be just for now, I felt so much freer. And maybe counterintuitively, it was easier to just be okay with where I was at, even though it wasn't quote unquote, like perfect for me yet. So I want to, so I want (laughs) to hear you talk a little bit more about why you were so preoccupied with that and Mm -hmm. the shift you mentally made to being okay with that. Yeah, that was huge. And you're absolutely right. This does sound like a nice clean, like, (laughs) oh, I did this and then it did work out. So I did this, but it was not, I mean, it was yeah. both emotionally just exhausting. And then it was also just a lot of reflective work and taking time to think about what you want is work. And I never really realized how much energy you have yeah. to put into that. So yeah, forever for now thing is one of the coaching nuggets that you gave me that has stuck with me, I think mm-hmm. the most. And so I had this idea that I was going to, and this this is from a long time ago, my whole life. I was going to find a thing, yeah. whether it was writing or acting or marine biology or you hear already all the variety of this, but I was going to find a thing and I was going to fall in love with this thing and I was going to become the best, brightest, most successful at that thing. I was going to be an expert in that thing. And then every time I would get bored or my interests would shift, I would feel very confused about, well, do I still pursue that or do I move on? And moving on was always this very painful kind of like letting go of that completely instead of, you know, holding on to the part I liked. Mm -hmm. And so when I was in the job I was in, when we met, I still had this notion of like, I'm in this career, so I need to climb this ladder and follow these steps in order to be the best, most successful expert with the biggest title. Like, I want to go as far down this path as I can. Or if I'm not going to do that, I have to completely trash this and start over again. (laughs) And I was turning 30 or right around 30. And I was like, I don't, that just seems exhausting to have to start over again when I felt like I had already done that so much. And one of the things you said to me is like, why can't you just do this for now? And we talked a lot about is it Brene Brown, the hummingbird? It's uh, versus, uh, good, almost. Or, well, oh, it's Elizabeth, Elizabeth Gil- Gilbert, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. I knew it was one of the two of them. Yeah. Elizabeth Gilbert and the hummingbird. And I realized through our conversation, and you sent that to me and shared it, 
that my whole life I had been a hummingbird. I had always been interested in all of these things. And Mm -hmm. I just, instead of like allowing myself to soak up the knowledge from each of those to just be whoever I'm going to be, I was very focused on like, there is a path and I'm going to take that path and that's it. Well, it would be so much easier if life was like that. If like you could just find your identity very cleanly in the work that you do and that was it. And I so much tied my identity to like what I'm doing that I think people like that who may be listening I hope identify with that feeling and also identify with the feeling that like it doesn't have to be forever, that you can just do something and enjoy it for what it is for now and know that you don't have to trash it completely. You're going to take lessons. You're going to take skills from that into whatever you go into next. Yes. It's so much more freeing. We've said this a million times, but I think it's different when Kristen or I are, pre- you know, or we're preaching it at people versus when we have someone who's living it and is not us and has a little bit of an outside <laughs> perspective and can say, yeah, no, really, though. <laughs> it's a lot easier when you give yourself permission to not have to be married to one thing for the rest of your life. And it doesn't mean anything negative about you. It doesn't make you a spaz. It doesn't make you... I think people need, you know, I think that logically it calms our inner, you know, our inner monkey mind when... Mm-hmm we can look at life as like a linear path that has sort of predictable milestones. And that's why we want to just pick one thing and set it and forget it for the rest of our lives is because A, it gives us identity and everyone is searching for identity. It's part of the human experience. And it also mitigates a ton of the unknowns. And the thing that we're most afraid of is unknown of any kind. And so you were able to sort of upgrade your thinking to the point where, you know, it was really your fear that had been in control of you, your desire to like think that things needed to be forever. That was just coming from a scared place. Right. Because you've, it was a fear too of like, if I give up on this, I'm losing something Mm. rather than a positive mindset of like, I'm just going to gain whatever I can from this and carry it into wherever I go. It was, if I give up on it's giving up, I'm somehow failing at this instead of moving on. I like how you just described that as sort of the mindset is often life is like a zero sum game. It's all or nothing. So mm-hmm. I have to commit to this and it has to be a hundred percent and I have to do it forever or else it doesn't count somehow. When really the way life works is you take whatever you need from something, and then you can move on to the next thing and it counts. Whatever you take from it builds upon each other. And that life is not like a game where if you don't finish something that you started when it comes to a job or a career, it doesn't somehow count and help you continually make progress for the rest of your life. That's so true. And I remember when we were talking, just having that deep fear of if I let go of this then I'm somehow less than what mm-hmm. I should be. And you really coaching me through that those feelings of, will I be hireable? Like, yep. will anybody, is someone going to look at my resume and be like, oh, she's all over the place. Or, and given that you have a job that you love now, just as an aside, clearly you proved <laughs> that wrong. People would hire yeah. you. <laughs> yes, yeah. And, and it's great too, because they're hiring me for the things I found most valuable from those careers. Which you can lean on and you can sort of spotlight and you can lean into, right? You yep. don't have to play up all the things that you didn't quote unquote finish. It's like we're playing a video game and we're like, if we don't finish that level, then I don't get to proceed to the next level. Life doesn't work like that. <laughs> no, it's more like Echo. Remember that video game? It was a no. dolphin and like... It was okay. So it's a dolphin. I don't even really know the point a of dolphin? it. Dolphin. I would have was, loved this. <laughs> it was Sega. And anyway, there was really no point. Like you just played as the dolphin and you like ate stuff and jumped. And I don't know if there was a next level, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> right. That's what I think when you talk about video games. Like, no, it's more like the Echo game. Like, right. You, you just, just play it because it's fun. Yeah. It's more it's like where just, we are. Exactly. You're not trying to achieve anything necessarily. You're just gaining fun and experience and knowledge. And then you're moving on to the next thing. That's it. Yes. Okay. So last fall, you lost your job. Yeah. And you were a mess. So you said. A mess. I was. Okay. So yeah. tell me about that because like, you know, you took a risk, I think, and you yeah. ended up in this place where you fell flat on your face and 
That's like, that's like the most terrifying thing that someone listening to this can hear is that, no, I took a risk and yeah, it didn't work out. And I was a mess and I was questioning everything. So tell me about being in that phase of life for a while. Yeah. So exactly what you said. I took a risk. I felt very confident in it. I felt like it was going to be a good match for me. I was stepping away from something, but I felt good about it. And I felt good about where I was. And it was good for a while until it wasn't. And like I mentioned, the company and I realized as their priority shifted that like we just weren't gelling and my position was terminated. And I have never, ever in my life failed that hard. Mm. I, you know, straight A student. Oh God, the straight A student getting fired is the stuff of nightmares, right? Oh my, yeah, you feel like you're <laughs> so out of control. My whole identity has just been blown up. <laughs> I am like the successful person, right? Like everyone likes me and I do well and I work hard and I never, and so to lose that just kind of shook me to my core. And last year in general was a year, um, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but I lost my dad suddenly. He passed away last April. And maybe you Um, did, but I I didn't remember. And now I'm, I'm really sorry. No, I, I mean, thank you. But it just the whole, my mom had a very serious health crisis right as I was going through losing my job. Jeez. So it was a year of, of tremendous loss. And then losing what I felt like was my identity and my career on mm-hmm. top of that put me in this place of, again, just wondering who I was. And luckily, because I think of our time together and because I am the kind of person who has always been interested in professional and personal development, all I could do is go back to the drawing board. Mm-hmm. I started desire mapping again. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about like what you did in that time in a second, yeah. but I don't want to gloss over a couple of the things that you told me in your, in your email okay. Yeah, because they just, first of all, like they're so normal and I hear a lot of people have these type of like literally you start questioning your whole identity so a couple of the things you told me you started questioning was I didn't even know if I was a fire starter anymore Mm -hmm. I didn't know if I was meant to live my passion (laughs) you literally said maybe living your passion isn't for people in the midwest which I thought was (laughs) hilarious because that is exactly what the inner critic will say when you are at your lowest is it will make up the most ridiculous, like, blanket assertions about, well, people in this general region of a country, they just aren't ever meant to live their passions. That's just how it works. You just better suck it up and deal with it. Just find a job that will make you money. You don't get to have passion here. Like, if you wanted passion, you should have moved to the the West Coast. Like, Right. You should live in a bubble, in an elite bubble somewhere, right? You shouldn't be in the Midwest because you're being real unrealistic. So... I don't even know what I want to ask you about that other than, I mean, I just wanted to make it clear that you started questioning like core aspects of your identity. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. So before like the desire mapping, it was a time of who, like, I mean, back to being 12 year old, you know, like, who am I? What matters? Like the big questions, Mm -hmm. like is everything for not, did I take this risk because I felt too sure of myself? You know? Right, was I deluded? Yeah, was I? I'm obviously like just delusional and thought I could do this and I could never dare go out on my own again. Like big, heavy, dark places. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to say is because we'll talk about coming out of it, but it's important to know for anybody listening that I was there, that I took a risk and then I fell on my face. And then you suffered for a while. And it was not comfortable. Mm -hmm. And it was hard. And it sucked. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's important to note because... We don't talk enough about that part. No, no. And that's life. Like the people around me were so wonderful not coddling me, but just allowing me to be in that place and saying like, yeah. you've had a rough year. Yeah, This year has sucked for you. Mm-hmm. Like you're allowed to feel those things that sometimes, especially I'll say in the Midwest again, but I think Southern women feel this way too. Like 
you're not allowed to be angry and sad and Mm -hmm. mad at God and the universe and frustrated. And, you know, they're very normal human emotions, but we're taught to kind of like suppress those and put on a happy face. Be like a Stepford wife, right? Just right. Like (laughs) smile through it. And I couldn't, I was at the place where I just, I was having these big existential like crisis and I needed to figure out my life. Like I just needed to figure out who I was and let myself be reminded of who I was. I love that we're talking about this because like, I don't, I do like sitting in this for a second with you instead of glossing over it. Because to me, this is the real stuff. Oh my gosh. This is, this is a good reminder that it is not only natural and normal for people to have terrible years where you experience loss after loss, where you then end up in a really dark place, a dark tunnel where you start questioning everything. You have very little hope. You have no idea if and when anything is ever going to change. You start wondering, what's the point? I mean, you get to this place where you're just like, I can't do it anymore. This sucks. And not only is that normal, I would actually say it's actually a healthy part of life, which is kind of counterintuitive, right? That yeah, to feel that bad is actually okay. And it's actually normal. And if you didn't feel that badly after all that loss and all of that like upheaval, I would be concerned for you. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And I, I consider myself a pretty optimistic person, a pretty like, we can do this. I have a lot of, I consider myself pretty persistent. I have a lot of grit. And I just fell apart. And I think that's important for people to know that like you don't always have to put on that happy face. You don't always have to be the one carrying the positivity in your life or being the person that supports others. Sometimes you go through those years and part of the lesson you learn is who is there for you. Part of the lesson you learn is how to grieve, how to grieve for others, how to grieve for yourself. And I, yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a healthy normal part of life that we don't talk enough about. Yeah. I also, I mean, I can attest that, I mean, in, I'm kind of still kind of in it in some ways, but that one of the things I'm, 2018 was not fun for me at all. And 2019 hasn't, like, it's a continuation of 2018 in some (laughs) ways. Yeah. But what I will say is that I look back and I'm like, if I hadn't had all of this crap to like work through, I wouldn't have deepened friendships I've had for years because I needed to talk to people. Like I needed to work through things. And in doing that, I became much closer friends with a handful of people in my life. And I really value that. And it is. So there are great things that can happen not only afterward, but while you're in that. In it. Yeah. Yeah, There can be great things that are happening. And maybe they don't feel great. (laughs) Doesn't have they don't have to feel great. (laughs) But you can kind of intellectually acknowledge the value of, oh, I am I am getting something out of this even while it's happening. Oh, yeah. Which is kind of, okay, so this moves this moves us gently and nicely into, like, you're still in this phase, but in hindsight, you can see that you didn't, you weren't working for, what, four months? And four it months. was, like, over the holiday season, too? Yeah, so we're talking, like, people are wanting Christmas, not wanting Christmas gifts, but, you know, right, like, it's the right. holidays, like, mm. you want to spend money, you want to give people <laughs> gifts, you, you want to yeah. like go out with your friends. And it's like and a cheery the- time of year and you're supposed to be cheerful <laughs> and you're not. And everyone's super happy and in the holiday spirit. And I'm like sitting over in the corner, like, Ugh. am I going to find a job ever again? Yes. And, and who am I without a job? Like, <laughs> And also, I'm sure you missed your dad. It was your first Christmas without first, him. Yeah, first holidays without him. And, you know, we had just been through this big thing with my mom. And so just the worry over her and, you know, like always kind of mothering her, like, where are you going? Are you okay? And um, Oof, that's a it lot. It was a lot. So... What's funny is that you said, in hindsight, I realized that for a long time, I'd been praying for a break. Like, I needed rest. And then I realized I got fired, (laughs) and I actually had to chill. Like, there was nothing for me to do. So I want you to tell me, in hindsight, why that ended up being a blessing for you. Yes. So before I took this risk that didn't work out, I had kept telling everyone, I just need a sabbatical. I just need like two or three months to like clear my head, to recharge. 
And it's so funny. Um, so for me, I'm a Christian, so I'll, I'll say God, but I know other people may replace that with other phrases. But it's so funny how God gives us things, but not the way we want them. <laughs> well, sometimes. right. And sometimes you need to ask very specifically or else <laughs> you're open to that kind of <laughs> answer, right? <laughs> right. So I had been praying and asking, like, I just want a break. I just, I'm so tired. I just want a break. And so I got my break. And I don't think I saw it at the moment because at the moment I was like, ah. How you were just panic reacting to it. Yeah. But I would say it was January maybe. And I was writing a blog post and in it, I was laughing at myself because I realized the conversation I was having with God was, well, what do I do? Rest. Yeah, but but what do I do? (laughs) But while I'm resting, like, what do I, how do I, like, should I be applied? What jobs? Like, no, just stop. Like, just stop and trust and rest. This is what you wanted. And so I was able to spend time going to lunch with my aunt who's retired. And we got to get really close and spend more time together. And um, my husband and I have moved, so I had more time to unpack and, and get the house ready. And I wasn't filling my time with stuff to just be doing stuff. I was filling my time with the things that were recharging me and re-energizing me and reconnecting me. And so that was, it was really a blessing. And it's, of course, I can say that now because like I get a paycheck, but even in that moment when I didn't have a job is when I realized like, this is what you asked for. It's not how you ask for it but this is exactly what you wanted at one point in time. So Mm -hmm. don't turn this gift away or don't... Don't turn your nose up at it, right? Yeah, don't turn your nose up. This is a gift to you. This is what you wanted. And it's a blessing. You need to treat it with the gentleness and hope and everything that you would, a real, like something else that felt more like a gift. Mm -hmm. It just was amazing to me that mind change and how much better I felt about it. It doesn't mean I wasn't still scared. I was still asking big questions, but it just gave me a piece about it where it was like, no, I need to see this time as a gift. And if I treat it that way, then I'm going to get out of it what I need to get out of it. If I don't treat it as a gift and I don't make the most of it, then I'm not going to learn what I need to learn. It's probably just going to end up happening again. Oh, you just said a lot right there that needs to be highlighted and circled in red ink for a second. (laughs) Yep. It's so, okay. So again, this is one of those things that's easy to gloss over. So I'm going to force us not to gloss over. Not just you and me. I mean, like collectively as an audience, we're not going to gloss over this point you just made, which is that you really only have ever two options of how you look at the world. And one is, I mean, I think it was Einstein. I talk about this all the time, who says... Mm -hmm. You have a choice between whether you see the world as a friendly place or a hostile place. And so you very, like, in being reminded that you had asked for this, it forced you to see it in a, to see what had happened to you as a friendly act, as something Mm -hmm. that was for you, not happening to you, which is another oft quoted thing that I don't, you know, at this point has no origin. It's just true, which is that you can see things as either happening to you or happening for you. And when you see things as happening to you, aka hostile, then you feel like a victim. You feel completely out of control. You lose all hope. And you really made such a good point. You don't learn any lessons from it because you're too busy ragging on what's happening to squeeze any sort of lesson or enjoyment even or just wisdom out of it. And so, yeah, when you're able to at least acknowledge, you don't have to like it. Let's just be real clear. (laughs) In order to see it as a friendly act, in order to see it as something that's happening for you, you don't actually have to like it. You can kind of grumblingly (laughs) accept that it's happening for you. But even if you kind of begrudgingly accept it, I think that, that then you're right. It enables you to actually say, okay, well, fine, fine, fine. This is happening for me. Just like a kid being told they can't have ice cream before dinner, they might grumble about it, but it's in their best interest, right? So if this is truly in my best interest, then I guess I got to learn something from this. And like, what can I take from this? So you don't have to be happy about it. 
That's no. A, just wanted to make that really clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Seeing it as a gift does not mean I wasn't like still like okay, gift like. But <laughs> yeah, thanks, I love it so much. I'm so happy. Yeah. But it did allow me to chill out a little bit, and it gave me the space to learn and to appreciate what was happening mm-hmm. instead yeah. of being a victim. So okay. You feared that you would never get another job again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that didn't happen. Mm -mm. So you did get another job. So tell me Mm -hmm. how that came to be. And then I want to hear about like, because you really love your new job and it feels like a win-win. And you've, you said, I've really never been happier. So yeah, I want to hear about that, how that came about. So the first thing I did was I realized that I had in this madness of feelings forgot who I was, which I think is normal when you're going through things like that. You're worried about everyone else and you're worried about things that need done and you're worried about life stuff. So I sat down and I did the desire map again and asked myself, okay, you get a blank slate. How do you want to feel? Because now I don't have, now I'm doing it in a a place where I kind of have the blank slate. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not saying I don't want to feel like this. I, I kind of just get to say what I do want, which was awesome. And I updated my resume. I had no idea how I was going to interview and tell people I lost my job and they were still going to consider me. But you know, I think there's always a lesson to be learned. And I was surprised how many people, when I was honest about what happened, and explained to them the situation, said, that's awful that that happened. We're so sorry. And, oh, I've been in a similar position. Yeah. It's awful yeah. when that happened. I couldn't believe how many people, instead of being like, oh, I don't want to take a risk on you, you failed pretty hard, said, wow, that's really cool that you took a risk. I'm sorry it didn't work out. It's happened to me too. I was like, oh, I'm not the only one. Yeah. And honesty (laughs) pays off. Transparency pays off. It makes you relatable. Right. Yeah. And and people had sincere, you know, feelings about it. And I felt like they got to see me a little clearer by talking through the majority. And they also got to see my attitude about things because I think attitude is really important. You don't always have to be, you know, Peggy positive or whatever, poly positive. I don't know. But you do have to have an attitude about life that allows you to move forward. And so I think they were able to see that in me. I interviewed for my current job. I love the team. They all are very creative. They're all very interesting people. They do good work. And it was just a good fit. And so now I'm in this environment where I have control over some social media and some information channels. But I have a team around me to bounce ideas off, to get content ideas from, to share when I'm struggling. So it's, it really is the best of both worlds. I have that control, which I think fire starters yearn yes, for. Yes. <laughs> that space to feel like I own something and this is mine. But I also have a team around me that I respect and I think can help me where where maybe I'm I'm catching up in some areas. And I get to be creative every day. I get to write every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm just really happy. It's not, and so funny, I, now that I'm here, the pay is not what it has been in the past. The title's not maybe what two years ago or three years ago when we talked, what I would have hoped for. But the feeling Mm. I go in every day and the feeling I have about my job is exactly where I want to be. I feel every day the way I know I want to feel. And that's such a different place from where I've been thus far. I mean, I think that's so important. Again, this should be obvious, but it isn't. Not to most of us. And we have to, even when we are familiar with it, we have to remind ourselves of this so often, (laughs) which is that... You don't want the things that you want because for any other reason than because you believe they're going to make you feel good. Right. And so feeling good is the goal. And so if you feel good, who cares what the title is? Like Yeah, and it, yeah. That's that's where I am right now. Yeah. So one other thing you said 
when you were updating me was that it's so nice to just enjoy something in the here and now. So really, you really have transitioned from needing something to be forever to just being able to enjoy it. (laughs) Yes. You know, and just learning to love it as it is without the pressure of it needing to become something that will save you. Yeah. And I just, that is just the most important maybe not the most important thing, but it's something I wanted to highlight because that is what so many of us secretly want. We just think, you know, when I get where I'm going, then I will be saved, quote unquote. Yeah. And I think that you're at this place where you're like, well, I've actually been through a dark tunnel and I realized that that, like I, I had a job and I was excited about it and then I lost that job and it didn't save me from going through that dark tunnel. (laughs) Like no. it's a it's a mistake to think that anything is going to save you. So, okay, this is just occurring to me to then turn it on you and ask. <laughs> so, how would you describe what does save someone? If it's not that, like if it's not the thing that ends up saving you, what is? I think the thing that saves you is really digging in and knowing who you are. Mhm. Because I think that is one of life's biggest questions. And I think people think they know. You can say, oh, yeah, I'm so-and-so. I do this. I like coffee or whatever. But like (laughs) taking it that next level and saying like deep down. So one thing I realized is I've always been creative. And I've always used this word as kind of like an adjective. Be like, yeah, I'm really creative. I didn't realize how much creating fuels me. Mm. I didn't realize how much having a blank canvas or a blank journal page or a blank Twitter (laughs) screen energized me. And so I think finding those things that give you energy, that's what saves you. Mm -hmm. It's finding those, those moments. It's not a thing. It's not... It's not a title. It's not a job. It's not a hobby that is going to make you rich and famous or whatever. It's it's those moments when you feel like, this is me. And I'm living in like the most pure form of my essence. Mm-hmm. I get to be 100% me, whether that's silly or serious or, you know, kind of a procrastinator or organized like those things that drive me, I'm able to do and they're appreciated. Mm -hmm. I think that sometimes, I mean, first of all, yes, you're spot on. (laughs) And second of all, I think that unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to choose to see it, it feels unfortunate when it's happening, when you're in the middle of it. But Sometimes the only way that you ever get clear about who you are is when everything you thought defined you disappears. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, huh. <laughs> who am I without that? And it's, I think that's it, oh, right? Like you said, yes. a blank slate is sometimes the only way that you get clear about who you were, like without everything else. I think this happens a lot in. I've not been in the situation, so I don't know, but I think it happens a lot to women when they're divorced Yeah, because they, especially women, I'll say that had like defined themselves in relation to their partner. Yeah. So I know somebody who um, defines herself very much by I'm so-and-so's mom. I'm so-and-so's wife. I'm right. so-and-so's daughter. I'm so, and that's great. <laughs> But you're so much more like with you don't need any of those other titles or barriers like you in and of yourself have so much to offer and have so much value just because you're here. And I think if we could get down to that and people could really see and appreciate that about themselves, then they would be able to make decisions based on that. And I think the secret, too, is that I think often real freedom happens when you realize that you can feel like a whole self-actualized person who feels clear about who they are without any of that other stuff needing to define you. Yeah. And it's so easy. It's so much easier to define yourself by your job, your relationship, 
Mm -hmm. your friend group, your association with whatever, it it just feels a lot easier, right? Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm this faith and I do this job and it's, but taking that away and saying like, who am I without all of that is hard, but it's, it's, I think the key, that's the secret. Well, and I will say this, that yes, dark tunnels probably teach you that lesson better than anything else because it's harsher than anything else, (laughs) but that you don't have to wait for a dark tunnel in order to start answering those questions because that's, that's what we did a lot of in coaching. Now, clearly Mm -hmm. it didn't answer all of your questions because that wouldn't be life. Life is a continual series of asking and answering questions. Right. But I think that, I think that that's a process that you can very much purposefully start when you're in a totally fine phase yeah. of life. You don't have to wait for life to like, you know, send you a curveball or fire <laughs> you or take away someone that you love. Like, absolutely not. And I don't think you should wait. I think no. if you wait, then you're going to be answering those questions. It's going to be even from worse. This depleted. Yeah. It's, it's just going to be that much harder because you're going to be answering the those questions while maybe depleted and sad and not at your best. I think if you are reflective when things are fine or maybe when they're not where you want to be, but you know, you have hope and you're not in this like ball of despair. Then when those things happen, because they will, they happen to everybody. But when those things happen, it makes those questions easier to, I think it makes it easier to answer um, because you've done some of the work and you can go back to that. And so you're more reminding yourself rather than trying to define yourself in that moment. That's very true. I agree. Having had some really difficult, like, ups and downs, I'm like, oh, wow. If I hadn't done all of the work that I've done before this, I fear what this would look like in another alternate universe where I hadn't done any of that, like, personal development or growth. Like, you have to be growing pretty much all the time so that... You can be as resilient as possible when life goes sideways, which it will. Yes. Yeah. I think that's the only guarantee is like nothing's guaranteed. Yeah. And you just have to like have that arsenal so that when things go bad, because they will, you're able to say like, I remember <laughs> that I am strong and I am capable and I am valuable, even if I don't feel it. You have to have those reminders. I don't want to end on a depressing note being like, yes, life is going to go sideways. Just get used (laughs) to it. Everything's going to suck and then it'll be okay and then it'll suck again. That's life. (laughs) Yeah, but here's the thing. (laughs) But you're feeling good now and you were in a dark tunnel six months ago. So I think that it's really important to zoom out and to see, yeah, we're we're telling you life is going to be hard and you're going to think it sucks and you're going to think it's unfair and you're going to want to rage and scream and cry and question everything. And six months later, you can be incredibly happy in a job that you love, like in just enjoying the unfolding of life in its present form. So like, yeah, that's nice. That's hopeful. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> I think that's the, the, the flip side of the coin, right? Is that there's a guarantee that things are probably not going to go your way. But if you believe that the universe is for you, if you believe God is for you and not against you, then you have to believe that things are going to work for your good, even the things that are bad. And if you have that mindset of like, this is terrible, but I can make it through. I know it's going to work. It just makes, it takes the sting out of that time. And it makes life on the other side so much sweeter Mm -hmm. when you're enjoying it because you get to just enjoy every moment and say like, wow, this is a beautiful gift I've been given. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. Contrast creates... So, I mean, I, we hate it while we're going through it, but in order to ex- in order to fully appreciate anything, you have to have often experienced the opposite so that yeah. you can fully like revel in having what you want. If it's taken you two years to find a job and you finally get your dream job, just the having of it will be so exciting and euphoric almost. If it only took you a day, well, is <laughs> who knows how much you're going to appreciate that really. Right. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. And not everything is going to be like that. Some things you will just get in a day because it's that easy. And that's great. But there will be some things. And often it's the things that you're most invested in that take the longest to pay off. Yeah. Just because, like, you need to put in that much sort of personal 
growth in order to get it, or you need to have that much contrast so that the payoff of it is even better than you imagine. And it doesn't necessarily have to feel good while you're in the buildup to that, but that if you're in the buildup, it often means that you can guarantee that there is going to be a point at which you get there. Also, why would we, why would we be even building up to something? Like, right. what, what would be the point of going on this journey at all? <laughs> you're right. <laughs> so, okay. I feel like, again, I could talk to you for eight more hours, but <laughs> I don't want to like I don't, break I the record for longest podcast ever. So I'm so grateful that I got to catch up with you. Hey, I, that's what this I felt like fun. this was. I didn't really feel like this was a conversation for anyone else. I just was like, this is what I like to talk to people about. And Sarah's the I best. Know, I, feel like, I feel like this was like a lot of our conversations. So right? I know. It's just affirming everything that we already kind of believe. And now we can just high five and walk away. And hopefully other people <laughs> got something out of this conversation. So I hope so. I hope if I hope two things. I hope if there are people that are going through a rough time, they just are able to remind themselves who they are. And then I hope that if people are feeling unsure about life, that they just realize that it's for now, not forever. Because um, I think I said before, that's one of the things in coaching that just stuck to me and has gotten me through and has allowed me to have a mindset that it's so open to possibilities. Yep. Because I'm guessing a year ago, you couldn't have imagined that you were going to lose your job. And six months ago, you couldn't imagine that you would find a new one, right? Like (laughs) so much has happened in the past no. year and yeah. everything was just for now, but you continue to be better and better off for the things that are temporary. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that. That was a good, like, please take, this is like a good, please take this <laughs> away, people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, I would love to hear what other people have to say to this and they know that they can go to the episode description and click the link and leave a comment because I know that I and Sarah would love to hear just, I don't know, what you relate to in this. And if you're in a dark tunnel, like, I want to hear about it. And I'm sure Sarah would like to hear about it too because it's okay to ask, like, is it really going to be, is it really going to get better? Yeah, it'll get better. (laughs) Yes, it will. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, and I will talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So just a reminder that we are currently enrolling some new clients into Clarity on Fire, which means if you have been thinking about working with us one-on-one in a coaching capacity, now is the time to sign up. We are going to be taking people's forms that say, hey, I'm interested in coaching until Friday the 21st. So you've got exactly a week to get your form. It does not mean you have to start coaching by then just means you have to fill out the form and say, I'm interested in coaching between now and the 21st. And if you're not quite ready, remember, we also have a wait list that you can join. Yeah. If you don't want to get started or don't like wouldn't be ready in the next four to six weeks, then put your name on the wait list and we'll contact you later if and when there's an opening. So again, you don't have to like be 100% committed to this idea. You just need to be seriously interested and like, okay, I want to make sure this is right for me. Let me talk to one of them and get some questions answered and just get clear on whether or not this would be the right move. That's kind of where you need to be mentally. So again, go back and listen to the episode from Tuesday if you want to get really clear. And if you want to get info about our people pleasing course, whatever that's going to be and whenever it's going to drop, because we're (laughs) still figuring a lot of that out ourselves, then go add your name to our VIP list. All of the links to these things are in the episode description. And we will be back again on Tuesday, like usual, with a new blog from Rachel. All right. See you then. Bye.